start with Ms. Strauss's consistently amazing poems. This is called Love Your Life. No, I don't hate technology. In fact, I use it all too frequently. But there's something that's distressing me. So in an effort of, of transparency, I'm going to try to illuminate the problem as I see it. It's a problem of duality, and it's ruining our society because we have given up our ability to, believe tender, to behave tenderly with the people we love. Instead, there's a chokehold on it, a peculiar hypocrisy of our democracy that in the name of safety and convenience is killing human connections. And thus, rather than have our love emanate caresses from our lips into the soul of another, it shouts from our hips in the form of a text or a tweet or some trite selfie from daybreak to daybreak like a tsunami or earthquake shattering our intimacy. Because in using technology, our so-called passion screams into the stratosphere where everyone can hear. And even if we think no one else is listening or cares, we no longer know what we feel without static interference from our so-called friends. Thus, what used to be sweet private whisperings are made public. Is there still a moon to paint your face when we lift our heads? Or has it been subsumed by the blue-green iridescence of your screen? Mined from a decimated African landscape, helpless to fight powerful corporations who have convinced the masses that if we just participate, if we just buy, 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 and bury the lies of necessity and addiction, we won't notice or even imagine the absence of our hearts beating in unison. I want to feel your energy embrace me, physically, spiritually, intellectually, as you focus on what I'm conveying with my fingertips and my breath. I want to watch you as tenderness falls from each eyelash to my lips, through the mist between us, and lands gingerly all over you like the first snow. And as your pupils dilate and your cheeks turn pink, I will know that what we have is true and good and human. Thank you. Hold on. on that note, shut those things off. Our first student poet, Mr. Jazz Meet Singh. Um, so I wrote a fairly short poem, and it's called um, My Intuition. Experience, the quintessential part of life to form empathy. Empathy, the ideal and God-given desire to help. Help, the experience that gives us hope. Hope on its own is the life force that drives us forward. Thank you. I would like to introduce my fellow MC, Troy Cronin. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello, my name is Troy Cronin, and I wrote a poem to express why I love track so much. At the starting line, I feel flooded with adrenaline. I ready my stance as I wait for the gun to sound. Runners on your mark, set, boom. As the gun echoes, I slingshot down the track. I exert all the force that my body can produce. As I sprint, I feel like an energizer bunny. I push myself to the limit as I hear the crowd cheer in the background. I hear my coach shout, go Troy. I'm out of breath, but I can see the end. I push even harder and I explode to the finish line. I feel filled with satisfaction and confidence. I have not won the race against my fellow athletes. I have ran faster than I ever have and am now one step closer to achieving my dream. A dream that someday I will represent the United States of America. I am not the, the fastest runner in my sport, but if I run with more passion, drive, and dedication, 
nothing can stop me. All right, next up we have Isabel Ness. I've walked this trail so many times at night that I don't look down though he shines his light. I'd rather fumble through blackness on my own than expose the dark with some light from a phone, but he doesn't think like that. He thinks he's some kind of role model, meanwhile, here he is whipping empty bottles into the woods, talking trash and fixing his hair, telling the same stories and thinking I care, but if I stopped walking, I don't think he'd notice. He'd just keep going, shining that light on each new route and trying not to scuff his shoes. He is his own best company, after all. And it's easy out here in the cold, damp weather to imagine this trail will go on forever, the useless ramblings never ceasing, the ache in my knees always so displeasing as we walk forever following a tiny shining screen. Thank you. Some really deep stuff there. Next we have Mr. Joshua Dobrow. <laughs> This is called An Elegy for Sherlock Holmes. February 13th, 1947. I forgot John Watson's name today. At precisely 10.18 this morning, John Watson came into my apartment. His hair had turned completely gray, and new laugh lines had formed around the corners of his smile. And I deduced that his youngest had just set off for college, and that he was putting a new garden in, and I smiled and opened my mouth to say hello, and I forgot his name. John Watson just smiled, and he told me it again because John Watson is my friend, and so we chatted like we had so many years ago. It was fine. It was all completely fine. I really shouldn't be surprised. The doctors that I visited have all been very kind, and they've reminded me that memory loss isn't strange for someone who's 82. Even for the smartest man in London, one who solves cases deemed unsolvable, caught criminals deemed uncatchable. It's not unusual, the doctors say. But... I forgot John Watson's name today, and John Watson is my Lancelot, my blessing in disguise, and so I'll be surprised when I forget the name of my best friend. The doctors say that these lapses are increasing, that my neurons will fire signals like a blind man at a shooting range. The doctors say that there are these parts in my mind filled with holes like a mole family went through my ear canal and kept burrowing. The doctors say there are these cracks in my brain where no matter how hard I strain, my train of thought breaks down at the station. The doctors say that these cracks will pile up on one another until the globe of my brain starts to form earthquakes and stress fractures in my frontal lobe. And eventually a giant crevice will form down the middle of my mind and split it in half and half and half again until my skull becomes an empty shell for a memory of a false version of me. And I will die with no reality left. But John Watson says that everything will be okay. And John Watson is a doctor too, even though he's retired now and I can see in the way he raises his wrinkles and crinkles his nose that he's half lying to make me feel better. But surely then, John Watson is half telling the truth, too. And even though it defies all the logic in my malformed mind, I want John Watson to be true. And so I believe that half with the whole of my broken brain, and I pray he might be right. But I forgot John Watson's name today. And where in God's hell does that leave me? Great poem, that was awesome. Okay, next up I'd like to tell you guys a little joke. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Where does a raven do its best work? Where? In its poetry.
<laughs> All right, well, n next up, we have the amazing Dorian Coase. I am a 40-year-old man pretending to be a high school kid, spying on them for the CIA. I wear a hood every day to hide my microphone and wire. I complain about my subjects to make it look real. Everyone is fooled. No one thinks I'm middle-aged. Every day I grab my red marker and draw pimples to really make it look real. I wear air apostle. Finally, my look is complete. I attach my microphone to my hood and strap on a wire. I walk through the hallway, hunchbacked, just like a real high school student, blending in. My microphone is secretly recording their conversations. The day is over. I pay for a school bus, not to draw suspicion, and I head home to my basement. There, I take the underground subway and report to my base for information. Okay, now I'm seriously wondering who's a spy in this school, because it's a scary thought. <laughs> Next we have Ezzy Harrison. Um, my phone's name is Silence. He yells louder than I've ever heard. Every bridge that I've made, he has burned. His unbearable rage, I just want to scream. He's a lot more chaotic than what it all seems. We can argue all day, but he always has the last word. He makes his point across, makes sure that I've learned. His questions make me feel malice, but my answers are way more tragic. Go away, I don't need you. This is my life, you can't control me. But unfortunately, he does control me. He makes me do bad things to keep him around me. I can't say anything because I have to listen and learn. But I want a chance to speak, is it my turn? He keeps me trapped in this lonely cage where every voice and every face is the same disappointment. I can't take it anymore. I may need some guidance. My name's Ebony. His name is Silence. Very descriptive. Nice job. Next up, we have Johnny Williams. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Stalking, lurking, lurching, paws padded and scarred, praying on prey to mar, glory will become new life, as shame dawns the ebb and night, fighting for a piece of day, just one more, let me see tomorrow. Three sons await their savior's scent, how this futile hunt has brought self to become hell-bent. Snap! The twig erupts a sonic, Omitting the notion that life is nearby, wolf whispers softly under breath, life do breed the young, do feed our sons. Now comes death, now comes silence. The hunt has ceased, sulking back from the void to a haven of life, living for one more waning still night. Come rufescent sun, hunt will once again have begun. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Sun shining, rising, opaque flower blooming. From the body of a rotting baby black bear slain just 13 hours past. For it was the white wolves, the white wolves in their ravenous flight. Counting corpses from the air. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Raven thinks to self, prithee that the hunt everlasting hath brought us new light. For this plague, rooted in heuristic ignorance, will bring us no life.
So can everyone hear this clearly? Is this like, okay. And this one too, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that definitely had some powerful imagery. The white wolves. I like that. Next we have Crystal Burgos. They put me in the oven to bake. Me, a deprived and miserable cake. Feeling the heat, I started to bubble. Watching my brothers, I knew I was in trouble. They opened the door, and I started my life, frosting me with a silver knife. They crated me with candy jewels. The rest of my batch looked like fools. Lifting me up, she took up my wrapper. Feeling the breeze, I wanted to slap her. Opening her mouth with sharp teeth inside, this was the day this cupcake had died. Thank you. Thank you, that was really powerful. Um, next up, we have Christina Strauss-Kennedy. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? Excited? All right. It was after Mama left that Papa started drowning sorrow in the sour taste of liquor. Fighting demons in the smoke, he began to bring home women. Then he'd tell his little girl, call them Mama. Wide-eyed and obedient, she did. Until they had all scattered into the wind, their dandelion skirts swirling as they ran, she never ran after them. A wounded animal can still bite you, and he did. His heart bled, but so did his knuckles. So did her frail frame, pressed up to the corner. He raped her of her innocence. She screamed, I am a sin for being born. And he would tell her, yes, you are. Thank you. It's a strong way to end four years of poetry, Chris. It's very powerful. Next, we have the lovely Jenica Haining. Yes. Thank you. Something's off. Maybe it's in the chirping of the birds in the leaves. Maybe it's in the tick-tock of the clock on the wall. Maybe it's in the turning of the pages in someone's book. Something's off. Perhaps it is me, a lapse of memory, a gap in the spaces of my mind, a beat off in the syncopated pounding of my heart. Perhaps it's in the twist of my fingers across keys, like my tongue as it stumbles over twisted tangles of tangible terms. No, that's not right. Twisted tangles of Something, something's off. I can't quite place my crooked finger on it. The words on the paper, they writhe. They spin and spiral and take flight. Like they yearned for escape, longed for freedom. The numbers of well-worn formulas suddenly seem wrong. Like they don't belong, like they don't add up. I hear the voices that people speak in, hear them as they shout, yell, scream, saying to me nothing, nothing at all. Something's off. Thank you. I could really feel that in your voice. Good job. Next up, we have Amanda Pagan. <laughs> All right. 
I titled this poem, Forgive Me. People always say, whenever you do something terrible, you'll be forgiven for it. I just wish I could admit that to myself. Yeah, I've done some things in the past that I regret. Not a second goes by without me wishing that I can take it all back. I've taken out my pain on myself by self-harming. The scars on my skin to prove it. Family helped me make it through all of the trauma that I've witnessed. <clears throat> but the people who I want to thank are my friends. They've stuck by me through thick and thin and helped me realize that it was okay to cry and be angry. My friends will forever be a part of my family and there are no words to express how much I love you. And I hope one day you'll forgive me. So next we have Madeline Grayton. Don't mind me just here battling a cold. Um, this is my shout out to all of the socks that I've lost in my life. Everybody does that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I promise that I loved you, though our partnership was fleeting. When I got you, I was happy, and when I used you, I was warm. When I lost you, I was grievous, and I deeply regret when I forgot that you weren't there anymore, when you were gone in the endless pit of my mess. You were an individual, and I took that for granted. And since, I have lost your other half, and I miss you both. I never really understood how much I needed you both, until the same tragic fate came to all of the others. And one day I realized, I have no more clean socks. I had lost all of their love. It was cold in my bare feet. They longed for the sweet cotton caress, a buffer between my cold rubber shoes and my suddenly lonely soles. That was awesome personification. It was really great because it sounded like just talking about the socks is just like it's all that same stuff happens to everyone else. So good job. <laughs> Up next is Sophie Flynn. Expectations. Um. And what am I supposed to think when, weak and dizzy in the night, I stumble on into my dreams of twisted horror without fright? What am I supposed to think when my muse whispers in my ear only thoughts that beckon close, not but temptations to draw near? What am I supposed to think? when I seem to drown before I land, when not but air and earth abound to fill my lungs with dust and dread, when people say I don't exist in morals and philosophy, what is my place on this gray disc when I choke and cannot see? Who decided words should hurt, should carve out wounds much worse than knives? Who auctioned off my childhood who gave them right? My friends, my bullies, my beautiful liars. Don't compliment the mature who are forced to grow up far too fast. And don't pay tribute to the poor who've learned to make the meager last. None of us do fit your scope, not your ideas for what we'd be. Don't 
complement the survival arts of those who live in depravity. Next, we have the lovely Ezra Cole Cohen. Yeah. Oh, this is really not. My poem is called Frequent Visits. It's about dreams. <clears throat> the circular room is filled with slowly fading laughter. In the dead center on the ground is a hexagon. Now everything is all gone, except a deep cacophony of blue and white sheets of the perfect hue. Whispers in my ear, she can't see what I hear. A round and tall giant standing by my nightstand. He leads me through streams and mazes, always with a helping hand, teaching me new ways to think in my future. This tall being is my tutor, tutor of the night, quiet being of the day. He wilts away as I slip back into this elusive reality, where bones are solid and mammals need air. I gasp for breath, and then I remember the giant's tips on vitality. Hold on to everything mean meaningful, it had said. A deep breath, and I turn and smile at the sleeping angel her amber hair in the morning light, sleeping in my bed. That was a great way to use your words to show us the story, so thank you. Next up, Nell Sanders. Hey guys, how's it going? All right, so my poem is called Greetings from the Youth, and I think all of you will relate quite a lot. Okay. Are you ready to learn? The classroom is silent as the professor's chalk draws rehearsed words on the board. You're going to learn math, please open to chapter one. And as his lips read the words that I've heard every day for years, I can't bear to hear it anymore. And I stand up because I can't stand it and spit a little bit as I say the words, this is it. Teacher, stop teaching us about X's and Y's and start teaching us how to live our lives. I don't care about exponents when moments define where our future lies. I am Nell Sanders and I guess I was chosen to exploit the truth about the complex minds of the youth. Sit down kid and learn your numbers, but he doesn't understand that I've only just begun. There are kids in the back of the room, foot bounce up and down. Soon they will be asleep, deprived of the oxygen we need. As we crack open a book, we didn't even read because we didn't sleep until we missed the bus wall. Backpacks full of boulders break the one strong bones that built us. And binders bind our wrists. Textbooks balance on each shoulder blade the sadistic game of which arm will be the first to break. Sleepless nights, words wrapping their ropes around me. Questions of identity arise. Who even are we? Waves of paper sweep by. A sea of paper cuts turns the water to blood and yet Teachers and adults have the audacity to tell us it's still not enough. Pressure pushes pins into the tips of our pinkies, our future rings us out to dry with the message, don't screw up now. And when we cry, we're taught to feel shame. Doubt and insecurities tiptoe around our bodies. Each insult is represented with a freckle that echoes in the silence when told we're less. We as youth shouldn't be stressed, yet English teachers still teach the scarlet letter while slapping letters on our chests and only regarding us as A, B, C's, D's, and F's. We're just trying to be confident and courage in a time where all words hurt and make us insecure. We're just trying to fight peer pressure. Handed to us in the form of a handle of alcohol. Tell me you wouldn't take a swig if it keeps the stress under control. And when we go home, we're a provoked time bomb, always aching to explode. I got a C plus. Parents head shaking as they tell me I'm wasting my life. Don't they know they put the word grades in degrading? But it wasn't always this way. We started out fine in the making. We had hope. 
In big dreams, as we looked at the sky and saw the world under loving lights curious, we used to question every sentence our parents spoke. We were the dragons breathing smoke in the nights to the rescue. What happened to those happy-go-lucky kids, the ones that replaced them only take refuge in activities our parents don't let us do? Those things give us shelter. Growing up should be calm like a zephyr. We weather the storms thrown at us, but the storms should never be strong enough to pull us under. But don't get down. The youth is like thunder. Fire is catching, bramble and thistle. So feel me like the whistle of the wind between our fingers as it flutters, flying, creating the feeling of coastlines out the window of our fine vehicle. And youth, with its good and bad, we build the banged up road we pad on. Our future flitting through stained hourglasses. Light creates hope behind our eyes. I hold a new hand every day because I can. Love comes and goes in constant evanescence. When we're young, it's easy to bounce back, though it doesn't mean we feel less. Adults still hiss at me and tell me I don't know what stress is, but deep down my youth will keep me from succumbing to adult issues because even though I am one teen out of an ocean of teens, my strength makes a difference, one fiber. In a game of tug of war, the rope stays unbroken due to the unspoken kids holding it together, oh man. The binding holds because truly the youth is our future and I promise our forever is in good hands, so. I finish this lecture with one last view. In the words of Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in this world. We as youth are the change. So my mundane teacher, please enlighten me. Or maybe in reality, I will enlighten you. Man, you weren't lying when you said there were a lot of rela sorry, relatable things in that poem. God. Wow, backpacks full of boulders. Can anyone else relate to that? God, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have Miss Opal Powers. Yes. You start as a cell with, with 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 from your dad. When these circles, cells shape, divided into two sperm. Then these tiny eggs form into fetuses. Start taking the shape of a human. This fetus into a baby. The baby forms into a toddler who knows little. A toddler who forms into a teen who has little power. Who knows from right from oh, oops. From the, that teen is an adult. Knows from right from wrong, has great power. And now the cycle starts again and goes on. Great job, yeah. I, I loved how you really expressed that life is a cycle and it's going to continue going on. <laughs> Next up, Jacob Kaplan. So uh, this is a poem I wrote for my Spanish class. So I'm going to read it in Spanish first, and then I'll read it in English. Oda a gaseosas. Gaseosas, la bebida para mí. Desde Dr. Pepper a Pepsi. Las burbujas con todo sorbo. Ellas consquian mi garganta y saben perfecto en mi estómico. Gaseosas, la bebida para mí. Fui loco para ti. Desde el primer sorbo, yo supe que tu sería mi nuevo amor. Por todas las comidas y todas las horas del día, mi bebidas favoritas, yo los bebo para la maría del día. Gaseosas, la bebida para mí. Tú me llenas con la energía de un niño. Tu calor es oscuridad a el noche o colorido como la fruta tu pruebas como. La una bebida que yo quiero beber hasta que yo muera. Ode to Soda. Soda, the drink for me. From Dr. Pepper to Pepsi. 
The bubbles with every sip, they tickle my throat and taste perfect in my stomach. Soda, the drink for me, I am crazy for you. From the first sip, I knew you'd be my new love. For all meals and all hours of the day, my, my, my favorite drink, I drink for most of the day. Soda, the drink for me, you fill me with the energy of a small child. Your color is dark as the night, or colorful like the fruit you taste like. The one drink I want to drink until I die. First off, I love the welcoming of culture into that. That's awesome. It really means a lot to me, personally. <laughs> also, it's a somewhat uh, kind of a personal story, but you are definitely not lying about the addiction of soda. My God, my, my cousin, um, her daughter, her, her first word, I believe, was Coke. <laughs> it's that addictive. <laughs> so next, we have Marta Sola Pfeffer. Yes. <laughs> Hey guys. Hey guys, sorry. Can you hear me? Eternity was out of stock, so I content myself with the present moment, acknowledging it in itself would be infinite until I no longer knew it wasn't. So each day I rise with the sun and try to live each moment as if the next didn't exist. That particular day was like morning until well after dusk, because like the sun, my joy rose slowly until it burst and rained down like the million minute streams traveling perpetually down the window panes. In the middle of the city, subversive pigeons paced the wet concrete like living kites about to soar. Drops of water landed on my nose as the traffic slogged through puddles. The stranger sitting on the bus that I waved to from the drenched sidewalk had a momentary look of confusion on his face before it broke into a smile that crinkled up his eyes, revealing lines that were apparently well used. I didn't know he would appreciate the simple motion, I wave at strangers whenever I move to, frequently without result. But that smile showed a truth that often gets lost in the, buzzle, the bustle of the busy streets, or anywhere in the world for that matter. I have no idea who he was, a small Chinese man on the fringes of Chinatown with his black coat leaning up against the window, holding a paper bag on his lap. He carried the air of someone weary from a long day until his face lit up like the Chinese lanterns that hung from the shop across the street. The waves in the ocean of his smile lap against a reaffirmed knowledge that someone cared enough to wave. So many people have gossamer connections, barely clinging to emotion, our awareness of the vacancy quarantined. That small Chinese man will never know my name or why I waved at him in the first place, but I'm sure he somehow knows the gesture was one of good faith. Not only that it would be returned, but knowing that the all people can smile at drenched strangers on street corners, and that a simple gesture can brighten anyone's day. It's the small things that count. This poem really was important to me because um, I could definitely relate. M when I was younger, my Grandpa was always very uh, open. I guess he loves greeting strangers and stuff. And although sometimes it can be kind of embarrassing, it's definitely it's it's a great thing to do because you get to make somebody's day better. And so I think it's so important that we acknowledge strangers. So great job! Thank you very much for that. And next up, the one and only Michael Kilty. Oh God, it is really right up here. Um, okay. Um, so my poem is called Nostalgia. <clears throat> I remember that it hurt. Looking at her, hurt. You meet thousands of people and none of them really touch you. And then you come across 
one individual who abundantly changes your life forever. Meeting you was like winning a grand prize, especially when gazing into your beautiful eyes. The moment I saw you, my heart was sold. The two of us together would never be cold. We met each other some time ago. It was the first time we had said hello. I felt the urge to put my feelings in writing because when I met you, I was struck by lightning. I was a much different person before. I was happier, I was open, I was curious. The potential for what seemed to be felt endless. But I knew that it would come to an end sooner or later, knowing that it would all become worse and that things would change, like a nostalgia for the present. If it was a sin to care for somebody as much as you did for your own self, my chance for heaven wouldn't be so high. And if it was a sin, I could understand why. Days pass and I hear the news. I wasn't exactly sure what arose inside of me. This feeling was new to me. I remember that it hurt. Looking at her hurt. Michael, that topped off all romantic events in any romantic movie I've ever seen. That was great. <laughs> Ready to get your anatomy on, guys? Next, we have Lily Glotting to the ones out. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, I wrote this for anatomy because somebody had to read one or else we couldn't go to the poetry slam. It's called Muscles. How'd it do? I'll make this one smooth for you. You cannot flex this muscle no matter what you do. I know you got abs, but this one's inside your belly. All of these organs that are probably very smelly. Like your intestines, both in the small and big, and your liver, along with your stomach, not striated. But my anatomy is underestimated because my buys and my tries and quads will do the deal. Skeletal muscle, the muscles I control for real. Don't mess with me or my punch you will feel. You think in about a day, well, it'll take months for it to heal. Then it will go straight to your cardiac. Don't worry though, a punch won't make you have a heart attack. Your lungs and your heart from your arms, it is apart. Involuntarily, it will make your day start. So all my muscles in my body, to you I say thanks. Now I'm gonna use my skeletal muscles to shoot a ball. Sank. Wow, Lily, that was a really strong performance. I really felt it in my bones. Okay, so next up is Emily Tan. I'm really short, guys. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just really nervous. Also, I have to do laundry later when I get home. Um, just give me a moment. You were the only one who could possibly know that I was abused for several years in my childhood. My twitching hands, my shaking body, my dead fish eyes were indicators that something was wrong. You analyzed my senses and examined my soul. You took observations and made decisions that saved my life, and for that, I love you. I love you for every touch of your hands on mine, for every kiss of your lips on my skin, each epithelial contact, sending signals to my brain, signifying that it was okay. 
for that. I love you. We sat in that class together, hands held on the desk or in one of our laps. It was safe. It was a second home. It was the start of healthy, strong structures, standing tall in the sky, our towers next to each other, big and proud. You were my sturdy base, and you held me up when I needed the support. For that, I love you. You wiped my tears away when my eyes poured out a personal rainstorm, my shuddering breath a clap of thunder as I felt the lightning shock my body. You held me chest to chest, stomach to stomach, and you were a lightning rod, channeling my anxiety to you. And you drew it out of my body like the smoke you inhale. For that, I love you. You were there for me for a little over two years. Two people who've been beaten down, threatened with knives when they were just kids. I still get nightmares of being ripped apart, beaten, raped, and you're the only calming face in my dreams. When I see you there, my mind and body stop thrashing for preservation. For that, I love you. You say you love me for every moment you get. And the words get caught in my throat, cobwebbing and coarse. We'll part ways for college, and I hope we can stay in touch. You've helped me get out of my bad situation, and I can finally clear my throat and say those words. And for that, I love you. I think we can see now that sincerity is one of the best parts of poetry. It's really awesome. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Next up, we have Charlotte Harrison. OK, so this is called Maybe It's Me. I used to think that you you were the topsy-turvy, you were the looming shadow. I would put on a smile and allow you to hug me, but my eyes would dull. I would loathe you with every waking moment, but I would be silent. Everything botched and broken, I would shove into a drawer in the back of my head, and it would fester there. I would let it distort my vision, and it would be your fault. But maybe it's me. You would walk by with that oozing smile plastered, wretched flesh contorted. I would look into your eyes, and there would be no sparkle. Yes, it was you. You with the coffee cups stacked. You smoking in the alley when you thought no one was looking. I was looking. You radiated cowardice, sticky late night ponderings, fear to hatred to self-respect swirling down the drain. But maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the one who shouldn't be watching, shouldn't be glaring, shouldn't be caring, shouldn't let myself follow your little path. Isn't that what started you? You with the well-hidden real self no one sees. You're vulnerable, but you, you can hide it well enough. I too fought with anger's warriors. Like you, I overcame them, and the world looked different. To you, it looked the same, cruel and harsh and low. So maybe it's me. Um, that definitely, when you said that um, all the anger festers inside of you, I could feel that because when you get so mad about something and you feel like maybe it's your fault and that there's nothing you can do about it and you just think that, oh, maybe I messed up. And so thank you for writing that because I think it definitely spoke to a lot of people in our audience. And because I think every one of us here has felt like when they're angry that it's Thank you for doing that. 
So next up, we actually have our first duo of the day. Um, we have Drew Thomas and Kyle Anderson. Okay. So it's like one last one, so we might have to kill it real quick. Raw fish, toothpaste, and no plans. So this is what it means to be a man. Pencils down, bottoms up. Enough of me, it's time for us. Health insurance, Obamacare. I love you, Obama, but it's just not fair. No matter what. I know I can. Finally reached Bowser's castle, here I am. Do not be afraid to fall. There will always be a floor. Only once you're on the ground can you truly soar. Nice collaboration, guys. Next, we have Kaya Wolfenden. I was like really happy when someone short came and shortened it because I didn't want to be the one to do that. But um, <laughs> um, I don't have a name for my poem. But um, yellow square, without any hair, pearly white teeth, more handsome than Chief Keef. <laughs> Only Krabby Patties, no kale, always chilling with Gary the Snail. His best bud is Patrick Starr. They get around in a boat, not a car. Squidward, his neighbor, always in a bad mood. The, squ the squid is just sick of the Krusty Krab's food. Cash Money Krabs, first name Eugene, always caught sipping on that lean. <laughs> then there's a squirrel called Sandy Cheeks. She knows karate and has acorns for weeks. Sheldon J. Plankton really hates Mr. Krabs, so he spends his time locked away in his lab. The boating teacher, Mrs. Puff, the Goon lifeguard is pretty buff. So many episodes, characters we cannot forget. Like the time SpongeBob caught all those jellyfish in that one net. At Weenie Hut Juniors, they finish Sundays with a cherry. This has to end now, but keep on living like Larry. That was sick. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's just, the people you're describing, there's something fishy about them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, to finish off the, the last uh, part of the Poetry Slam is Matt DeBrenzi. No, I'm not nervous, I'm terrified. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yes, yeah, just you right down there. Okay, so yeah, I call this one visionary. Around the world and back again. Um, I forgot, okay, oh, sorry, I'm gonna try again. Around the world and back again, shot out of a cannon that I was jammed in, slammed in when I landed. I could barely believe that I was still standing tall, but not straight. But if good things come to those who wait, then why was I still waiting? The the present is a gift, but I couldn't return it. I couldn't find happiness. I had to earn it. And I only had these words burning a hole in my pocket, so I spend them and speak them now, ready to shock them and show them, lick the tricks up my sleeve. So let me just tell you the story, and I'll make you believe. And a tale full of life that springs forth from the inkwell that catches your ears and your eyes if you think well. And it begins with my flight into the night on Icarus wings through silver-lined clouds and many wondrous things, but I never touched the sky. And so I fell into a bottomless pit. Around the world and back again, a journey in the dark, footstep after heartbeat, looking for the sparks that fly just to keep warm in the face of braving some terrible storm and maybe looking
for the monsters under our beds, the things that go bump in the night and in our heads, because I was convinced that these were none other than myself. The people check their closets for me and nothing else. Was I the monster terrorizing your imagination or simply taking the place of some other manifestation pulled from fantasy to reality, the object of your nightmares? But in actuality, I'll be way up in the sky with man and the moon. But I'm afraid of heights, so I'll be back down soon. Gravity, not tragedy, will bring me back down. Down with Jules Verne, 20,000 leagues under the sea, diving for treasure and living so free. So don't get so down. Because I'll step in and turn things around, put you in a spin, set the world on its ear. So just give me a listen, and just once will you hear my deepest thoughts, my wildest dreams, and only best intentions. And for my grand finale, this very invention, because the Renaissance man ain't got nothing on me. Because I am visionary. Love yourself, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, hope you guys all have fun today. Uh, first up, we would like to welcome the lovely culinary arts teacher, Miss Pickering. I'd like to dedicate this poem to all of the future food artists in the culinary arts and the baking and pastry arts classes. <laughs> Thank you. My poem is called Cake Sprinkles. Like colors from the peripheral lines beside my eyes, they dance and fall down upon it. We are given a challenge to make food science an art, an expression of our kinesthetic skills made whole by a leavening agent. So pretty, so full of colors that the eyes often blur three or four together as they fall. I'm falling to a purpose. Thank you. So next, we have the awesome English teacher, Miss Bernhardt. Hello. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleagues, Suzanne Strauss and Heather Ducker Brown, for encouraging me to get up here and for bringing poetry to our building for 17 years. Common Core. We've got you with our creativity. Um, and um, Nell, where are you? The poet Nell. There you are. I don't know you, but your poem was awesome. And I think you're dead on. And I called my poem A Cure for Stress. Whenever a student puts her head down in class, I want to drive her home, prepare her a hot dinner, confiscate her phone and tuck her into a bed with fleece sheets before 10 p.m. The next day, if she comes to school cured, I'll loan her my purple Sharpie for the life-changing notes I write on the whiteboard. One, be here now. Two, take risks. Three, don't believe the hype. And four, use your voice. If she rolls her eyes while my back is turned, I will hand her the Clorox wipes and the bathroom pass and a free reminder. If you're not enjoying yourself, you're missing the point. Are you listening to the ripple? An idea dropped in a pond, simple, a transition. It spreads to each pencil, thin, wooden, and renewable. Use it. Shh, don't keep a secret, especially when you're patient. I'm sorry. Don't keep a secret. You can find inspiration anywhere, especially when you're patient. 
like a peony that waits to bloom when the ants find its nectar, when the water reaches a tipping point and your headache recedes, when the index cards are filled and people call your name to see, to hear, to rejoice in poetry and our innovation. Thank you. That was a very awesome poem. It really spoke to me, and I thought that it was uh, it relieved my stress just hearing it. So <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have the very talented Jasmeet Singh. So I did a poem, um, second period, and uh, I was given the opportunity to do a second one, and I whipped this up about a week ago, and um, <laughs> oh, well, this is okay too. Um, so in this poem, I, when I wrote it, I was feeling really sentimental, and um, for those of you who know me, I'm a very sentimental guy. <laughs> so. <laughs> So given that sentimentality, there are some references in this poem, which I hope some of you will get, who've known me for a while, and I hope the rest of you enjoy my poem. So here we go. He wants to know his name, but he's unable to read or write it. Granted, child that he is, but so eager for life, spends it lying, setting up a ruse, but lying didn't give itself away. It came forth like a long, straight, and wooden shadow in the night, not very distinguishable. Orphaned at a young age, but full of heart and hope. Tomorrow, the child says, is only a day away. Maybe, he says, I can make up my own name. Hmm, he thought, what do I love? Ooh, I love raspberry crepes and gilded jack-o'-lanterns. <laughs> but alas, he was dissatisfied. Oh, he's got trouble. Oh, yes, he's got trouble, they say. But what can the poor boy do? There's no one to teach him his name, not me nor you. And the ruse, he gasps to escape by the skin of his teeth. He gives up, and he says, God, spell out my name. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. You never fail to uh, satisfy the audience, so thank you for that. And uh, so next up, we have Sydney Deal. Okay, there we go. A little bit of short problems. Uh, so my poem is called The Motivation Station. Um, here I am back at the slam, and shoot. I still don't know what to write. I was thinking maybe I want to inspire. I want to somehow make my peers redesire. And it's not that my anaconda don't want to, but honestly, I think there are more important things to do. So I guess you could say I have this mapped out. Swim or sink, Michael Phelps or Titanic. I know kids feel pushed to the brink. They start to panic, whether around school or annoying, suffocating, outright and just parents, or around just trying to fit in under the category of cool or the past, or the future, or the mind thinking too fast. But brah, you can do it. Don't throw a fit and just quit. Be a mess for a minute, but then jump back in it. You're the only person who can walk your path. You're the only person who can put all the bubbles in your bath. It's your life, just choose to live it. Just be yourself. Well, and if people don't like you, well, too bad. One day you'll be going up in the club on a Tuesday. And... <laughs> And they won't be. <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to say is, even though life is like a bucking bull, be the big poppy matador. Be the commander.
Love the popular references there. <laughs> so next we have Aurora Flynn. Open parenthesis, G-E-N-E-T-I-C-S. Close parenthesis, genetics. Punnett squares, big B, little b, big B, little b. Genotypes and phenotypes. Genetic specificity and the way you look. Nice. So next up, Buddy Scott. Let's hear it. <laughs> this, is a, this is a poem I wrote called Brothers. I'm climbing a ladder inside of a clock tower. My brother only 10 steps behind. He followed me. He chased me because he's trying to find himself within me. Though the cogs around us clank, I can hear his tears and his cries of fear. Brother, I love you. Come back. I don't want him to follow me, for, for my ladder leads to a place of which I wish him not to see. For at the top of this climb, there is a room. A room that is dark, black as loneliness itself. A room with the half-life of my lifetime, however long that may be. I have grown to shield and shroud the radiation, but his mind would migrate in merely a minute of exposure to my twisted solitude. He climbs faster, I climb slower. His tears fall from higher, my tear count lowers. He reaches out an unscathed hand and dribbles out an I love you, drowned in tears. It is at this moment when I look up at my brother, and when I look down at my brother and he looks up at me, that all becomes clear. Give me a minute. I reach, I reach out a blistered hand and grasp his gesture and lift him to my level of this ladder. I strap his arms over my shoulders. Over the sounds of the cog, cogs now roaring, I say to him, hold on tight. We're going to my room. I will plaster the room in lead and light candle after candle, all for you. And with his heart pounding against my vertebrae, we climb, not just together, but as brothers. Thank you. I definitely hear you on that one, buddy. The bond of siblings is really powerful. <laughs> Next up, we have the creator of our NHS literary magazine, Sophia Gerstel. It's days like these, when the storm clouds hang low in the sky like helium balloons deflating on the ceiling of the middle school cafeteria during the last dance of eighth grade. And they take me back to the heat, to the whine of the music, the crush of the bodies, the ticking of the clock, and the unchecked boxes on the calendar. It's days like these, when the sky splits clean and unpassable as a military border, between clouds and clear blue. When, uh, when, ugh, sorry. When the rain has been coming in spurts, off and on, all week. And so, after being caught in the downpour one too many times, I find myself with a raincoat and no rain. A knight, encased in a brand new suit of armor, who stumbled onto the battlefi battlefield late, gleaming and impenetrable to find everyone else already gone. It's days like these when my mind starts to wander and turn to floods. 
I'd stare into puddles and see the mirror sky closing in on me. Envision the whole street underwater, merging with the sky into a blue-gray kaleidoscope. My feet skid on the sodden leaves and my dimensions collapse. I lose sight of up. For a moment, I wish I had fallen into the water, that my wicked witch body had melted away, and then I would resurface, gasping, in another puddle, in another rainy small town, reflecting another partitioned sky. Way to keep the uh, <laughs> nice job keeping up the momentum. Uh, the poetry that was great. So um, next up we have Jose Cordova. All right, so you guys know about the modern day stuff going on with police brutality and stuff. Rest in peace to Michael Brown, Eric Garner. Um, I labeled my poem, Hands Up, Don't Shoot. I'm done with all the killing, all the violence, all the stealing. And as for all the killers with the devil they've been dealing, cops are like the devil's soldiers. He controls their inner feelings. Rest in peace to Michael Brown, best of family through the healing. They say self-defense. They say they're acting out of fear. Yet all of a sudden, they can determine when your fate is here. They label and disrespect us, then choose to end our life. Yet receive no consequence. How do they sleep at night? But somehow to them, something must have really got in us, because now they label us sinners, but who are the real killers? But to everybody, they just doing the right things, beating and locking us up while they living just like kings. Then they hate us for expressing how we feel. Through the protests and riots, through the music, I'll be real. My thoughts are my shield, then my pen is my weapon. But I'll just speak my mind to redirect all the aggression. But when I put my hands up, I hope you don't shoot. Because deep down inside, I'm just a human like you. And I won't even have the might to try and fight you. I'll just put my hands up. The rest is up to you. <laughs> That was a fantastic tribute. Thank you, Jose. Next, we have Aiden O'Donoghue. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so my point is Timmy. Timmy is my lovely brother. Timmy loves Aiden. He is funny. He is great. He is nice. He is smart. He has blonde hair. He, he is the best brother I ever met. He helps me with my math homework. He gave me advice about girls. He makes me happy. He cares about me. He went back to school in Indiana. He likes to hang out with Phoebe. He likes to go to Princeton, New Jersey. He has my heart. Aiden, that was fantastic, and uh, that's awesome that, that you look up to your older sibling. It's really great when you can have such a great relationship with a family member like that. It's cool. So
So next up, we have Anna Asher, and um, reading it will be uh, Marianne Lockwood. As he said, as he said, this poem is by Anna Asher, and it's called Flight of the Dragon. The dragon opened its colossal, majestic wings, slowly letting the golden sunlight on them. The dragon looked up and jerked its wings up then down to get a lift off. The dragon kept its wings vertical and soared as if it was weightless over the gorgeous blue ocean. The dragon's wings were getting tired, so it sought out a place to rest. The dragon found an island with glowing golden sun. It seemed to call its name. The dragon landed gently, like a balloon hitting a trampoline. The dragon shut its colossal, majestic wings and went to rest. Having a dragon would probably be the best things in the world. I mean, flying all over the world would be awesome. <laughs> Next up, we have Cade Holden. My poem is about teachers. Nice, funny, crazy, <laughs> brave, honest, fun, jokes, famous, friendly, cool teacher. She makes me happy. That was incredible. I really appreciated that one. Uh, I think it makes learning so much easier when you have teachers that you love and can relate to. So nice job. OK, so next up, we have Max FM. Okay, so my poem is called Sticks and Stones. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We're taught from a young age. We repeat this to ourselves in growing up. Words will never hurt me. Words can't hurt. Words aren't capable of that. But words are capable of that and so much more. This is for the one who called me manipulative, who said I asked too much of them, who said I was a bother, a burden, too much to deal with. This is for the one who called me it, who dared to refuse to respect me as a person, who in saying that compared me to an object as if I have no feelings. This is for the ones who still call me by my birth name despite me telling them otherwise because all I hear when you say that is freak. This is for the ones who say, it's just a phase, you'll get over it. This is for the condescending tone I get whenever I speak to someone. This is for the one who said I was the cause behind my best friend's suicide. This is for the ones who have ever made me feel anything less than okay. But this is also for the one who always held me and told me they loved me on a bad day. This is for the ones who still stick by me and support me with their words every day. This is for the one who told me everything was going to be okay and meant it. The one who told me that they wanted to be my rock. This is for the ones who I see every week, some even every day, and, and offer me their unconditional love and support when I need it. This is for the ones who know exactly what I'm talking about. Sticks and stones may break my bones, 
but words will never hurt me. It's a lie. Words have that power. They hurt, but they can be a saving grace too. I think that was fantastic, Matt. Max, <laughs> true to the heart. You're right. I think having true friends who are willing to pick you up is probably one of the best feelings in the world. So next up, we have our second duo of the Poetry Slam, Emma Tanner and Sydney White. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm Sydney White. <laughs> I'm Emma Tanner. Um, before we begin, <laughs> wait, hold on. Since, okay, Good so long. our poem isn't that long, so we're actually gonna talk for a minute. Um, <laughs> you know. All right. So first of all, we we really wanted to enter a poem into the slam. We thought it was a really good idea, so we thought and we thought, but we couldn't think of anything to like write about. So then we thought of a common interest of ours, and we were like, sports. <laughs> so then we decided to get a little bit out of the box, and what? we, you know, we decided to write an acrostic poem, which I don't think has been done yet. So in case if any of you don't remember what acrostic poem is from elementary school or whatever, acrostic poem is essentially you have all the letters on one side, and then you have like a word or a phrase that corresponds to the overall theme. With the letter. So yeah, like the letter begins the sentence. So our theme is sports, and it's an acrostic <laughs> poem. Um, but before we begin, we'd also just like to give a shout out to all the excellent poets here, because yeah. Okay. Woo! Oh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's some really deep and great stuff out there. So it's been three minutes. We should probably start. One last thing. We'd like to dedicate this poem to our English teacher, Ms. Hopkins. Ms. Hopkins. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. And also to Lily, oh sorry, and also to Lily Gladding Di Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. This is sports. Yep. S. <laughs> sorry, we're gonna start over. This is, we're not gonna laugh. <laughs> S. Sports. <laughs> P. <laughs> Play. <laughs> P. Playing sports. Oh. Oh my goodness. Sports. R. Remember the time I had to go to the emergency room because I broke my T. Toe. S. Sports. <laughs> Now that is one cool poem. And speaking of cool poems, I have a joke for you guys. <laughs> Who is the king of cool poems? <laughs> Robert Frost. <laughs> Come on, man, that's just cold. All right, and next up, we have Mateo Rivera. All right, this is my poem. You lie awake at night, engage in an endless fight, thoughts in your head, memories surface. You're wishing you were dead. Day after day, you fight through the darkness, trying to find light, despair and sorrow, wondering if you'll make it through to tomorrow, trying to fight through your pain but the thoughts in your head driving you insane. Silent screams in the form of tears rain down your face. 
the voices in your head telling you you're a waste of space. You can't take the pain anymore. You know that tomorrow there's more pain in store. You lie awake at night, engaged in an endless fight, wanting to die before tomorrow, drowning in personal sorrow, another session of depression. This is a battle. It rages on. Your fears begin to win. Falling fast into a deep abyss, this is a battle. You can't win. Very deep, Mateo. Very, I think we can all, I feel like there's this theme going on with some of these poems. And I feel like it's, it's any, everyone can feel it. I have a sense of that. So thank you for voicing that, because not everyone can do that. I think we all appreciate it. Now we have Mr. Sadia Shevin. Someday my prince will come. 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 Someday. My prince will come. Someday, my prince will come. Someday, my prince will come! <laughs> Someday, will my prince come? Someday, my prince won't come. Someday, my prince won't come. And he won't come riding in on his golden steed. No, it will never be. Because God is dead. Innocence is over. All right, the atom bomb has dropped. Art is nothing. Man has killed himself. Thank you, Sadia. That was certainly like no other poem tonight, so good job. All right, so next up is Prince Jimmy Murphy. All right, so this uh, poem is dedicated to someone I love very much. All right. Um, during the summer, you exemplified within me the curiosity of a small child in the midst of discovery, in the fall and awakening from the egocentrism that had blackened my young mind to the euphoria of life and experience. You chipped away at the cracks of my heart and the sheath of my soul, revealing revelance in the quietude of things. Perhaps what isn't said is more meaningful than any word can paint you taught me. What is written, what is spelled, is far less significant than what is felt. Well, I know how I feel, and what I feel is love for life, for experience, and most of all, for you. Thank you. You rock, Jimmy. Dude, you really do. <laughs> Next up, we have Miss Deborah Cologne. My poem doesn't have a name to it, and I actually really don't know what it's about, but I'm going to read it anyway. All right. I feel the coldness in the air. All I can see are blank-faced stares. 
The air is thickening. My eyes are widening. All I can see is fog. I can't see anything. The walls are closing in. My body's shivering, but I can't feel a thing. Maybe it's that feeling inside me. Maybe it's the walls caving in me. Maybe it's the howls in my ear, but I can't feel a thing. I sit here for a bit. I let the earth move around me. I hear the winds whispering in my ear telling me, don't fear, your savior is near. Let the monsters fear your braveness because you won't feel a thing. My touch prickles your skin, my fingertips make you fringe. My breath heals your wounds and my love cures your moods. No other space will compare the, lonely, the loneliness beyond its dare. Because no matter the pace you face, there will be no ending. The trip will find a way to keep going. Let it happen, let it stay. Because the only thing that will pray are those in need of God today. Thank you. Keep it up, Hamp. We're doing good. Next, Next up is Claire Jordan. Once upon a time, I met a ghost with skin of glass and bones of ice and words that fractured as they left her lips. And she lived inside my house but caused no harm, no mischievous poltergeist tricks, only walked quietly, sang softly, asked for help the only way she could in words I did not understand. She lingered in the hollows of my ribcage and carved into them a mimicry of home, caused no harm but made it easier to be lonely. And on nights when the moon was a knife and the stars burnt blindingly, she tried to run, for my ghost is an escapee who wishes to be, who wishes to be lost in the woods and not return, who wishes to become the murmuring silence of the night, who pulled on my heartstrings to ask if I would go with her, but I was not a ghost. My ghost would pull the stars down and weave them into the shape of a heart to keep in an icy chest. Would burn herself on the violence of sunsets to try to remember living. She makes claws out of soft hands and screams to an unhearing moon. I do not want to be a ghost anymore. But what else could she be? Once upon a time, I met a ghost, um, a ghost who walked through walls and laughed at bluebirds that hit our window who left cold footprints on the floorboards and the freezing mist of her breath to linger somewhere between here and the next, who called home the summer sky and the violence of a thunderstorm, whose words froze on the way from her lips to my ears, whose words reminded me too much of home, and I would have given her my heart had I one to spare, for she was glass skin and ice bones, and ghosts were never meant to stay. <laughs> Very powerful ideas in that poem and very powerful imagery. Stars burning blindingly. Yeah. Next up, we have Zoshi Calero. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> so, the name of my poem is called What If? What if there are no borders, and the world was an equally shared space? What if there are no wars, and humans never kill each other? What if people got what they deserve, like a free education and health care? What if schools taught you useful things, like how to pay your bills and pay taxes? What if one person said their god was a gorgeous woman with purple hair and three eyes? What if someone else said they believe a virgin gave life to God's son, a white man in the Middle East? What if when you asked a pregnant woman what gender their baby is, they say, I don't know, I'll have to wait to see what they decide when they grow up. What if I told you I was high and bi? What if you're straight edge and gay? What if everyone could marry whom they love? What if there are no words to separate us, masculine, feminine, black, white, rich or poor? 
What if people weren't afraid to be themselves and not commit to social standards or be pressured into doing things they promised they'd never do? And what if other people didn't shame them for their life decisions? What if people didn't have to walk down the street in fear of cops and women didn't have to be afraid of what they're wearing as they walk home alone at night? What if we could live together without fear of killing our own race, killing the world we all need to survive? What if people could realize what we're doing to ourselves? What if we never needed to say, what if? Cool beans. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to warn you. Up next is Case and Warner. Uh, being too tall. Uh, my poem doesn't have a title because it's about feelings, and those, as we all know, are really hard to put a title on as much as we want to. I am afraid that I will not be taken seriously. I'm afraid that some will call me a wimp. That is not the point. The words came through the static out of the phone. Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes. The start of my defeat, the end of my hope. This is my life. Why a thunderstorm? This isn't a TV show. Run, just run. What am I running from? The truth. Normally, I can always handle it. Normally, always, mostly, sometimes. Where am I? Two miles out, can't run anymore, can't feel the rain anymore, shivering, hypothermia, time to go back. Days pass. I am told to leave work for today. Apparently it looked like hell. I feel worse. Just get home, just get home, just get home to bed. The nightmares were the worst. I could see everything. He touched her. She touched back, stop, oh stop, please stop, turn it off, why do I keep imagining it? It's just a damn loop. Lost my will to keep going, lost my will, lost. Carry on. Months pass, never had I sunk so low. Many nightmares I have witnessed. Why fall to this one? In the end, I guess I wasn't fighting her. It was me letting myself go to the unknown. Like you said, Kaysen, it's hard to put a title on feelings. Just like I'm having a hard time calling these poems anything else besides powerful, because they are, they're deep. They really are. So next up, we have Miss Arisha Simpson. You don't know me. You know who I used to be. The little girl on the playground all safe and sound, playing with the toys, not worried about no boys. That was the old me. You missed it. That's all past. I've grown up so fast that you haven't even seen me as a teen. Not interested in staying home. Not interested in being alone. Always out with friends. Not meeting ends. It's how I am now. Stop training like a kid. I ain't in no crib. I'm sprouting like a weed aiming to succeed. Get over it. You missed it. You missed me. You missed how I used to be. <laughs> Superb, keep going guys. Next up, Alan Corman.
Okay. This poem is called One Eye. It sees without dimension, no front or back or in between, a globe glowing in suspension. Everything is seen. Off perched upon a thick great cloud or resting in the boughs, coming in from anywhere, the world it can arouse. Oh, what a way to die, staring into that one eye. Yet, many ones, when it's their time, avert their pupils lest the sublime should crumble under the force of their nakedness. For it sees you, animal, and all you do, and all you think, and all you dream, no space between what you are and what you seem. The words you drink, the smiles you scream, there is no blink to cut off the other from your eye. Sometimes I wish that I could throw a stone, a spear, or draw a bow and pierce that one great eye. Then all the world would truly be he and she and you and me with plenty of air between. I wouldn't have to feel like spectacles under a wheel. Yet, if that great spear was wedged right in and the line of life was the line of skin, tell me, how did it begin? How on earth did it begin. Thank you. I'm really going to miss this poetry slam. Really, that was fantastic. <laughs> Maybe I will. Um, I have a joke for you guys. Just uh, letting that. <laughs> <laughs> so, who do you call when you want something to be clearly understood? <laughs> Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> so, next we have, next we have uh, Thea Everest. Anger, it, boil, it, it boils and brews inside you, churning and seething, frothing and foaming, that restless and tireless thing that lives inside us all, waiting to come out, waiting for a moment when it can unleash its merciless howl before you, that moment when all hell breaks loose and you lo lose it. You feel like Godzilla, stomping on buildings as if they were ants. You go on a rampage where no one dare cross your path, because if they do, they end up cowering in fear, hiding in a corner while they hope they'll be safe. And when that rampage is done, you're left broken and scarred, no will to go on, no motivation to continue your life, or you're left as blank and lifeless as a stone wall, hard and unwilling, all emotion locked away, locked away in a chest, a chest that was chained, welded, and even barred shut, then dutifully brought on a ship to where the ocean was deepest and thrown over the side with a thousand anchors attach attached to it to guarantee safe passage to the bottom. The only emotion left alive was anger, the one who threw away the others, leaving them to drown slowly and painfully. Now, only the ghosts of these emotions are left. They rarely appear to the naked eye, but when they do, they explode. <laughs> Nice job, all right. Keep... Mm. No. Uh, so next up, we have the super star track runner, Roby Najame.
Hey. Oh, thank you, Marcus. All right, so I want to give two quick shout outs. One to Miss Brown for getting me interested freshman year in the Poetry Slam. Could never have done this without her. So thank you to her. Round of applause. <laughs> and second to our wonderful MC, Troy, who isn't wearing the track spirit today, even though we have a meet against the Chickabees today at 345 at the Smith Gym. Thank you, Troy. All right, so I guess the title of this poem is Dreams by Radon Randell. Poof, a light quiet sound that reverberates through the small room of whitewashed walls as chair and body of mine alike tumble through the cracks now formed in the floor. The weightless feeling, falling oh so very slowly, a watch running out of battery, a decaying speed math problem in algebra, depreciating until time and movement is so minuscule that it ceases to matter. When my face finally collides with the floor, time speeds up, the Mayan falcon going into hyperspace, falling out of a pool of tranquility and into a world of chaos. Pounding sound ricochets around the buildings of NYC, a Macy's Day parade of noise blasting in my ears as I fight to center myself on West 34th Street. Pushing the door open of the Starbucks underneath the once mightiest of the world's buildings, I step into a cool rainfall on Midsummer Night's Eve, a light pitter-patter of dreamlike H2O, water running down my arms, tickling the hairs on the backs of my hands. A deep breath taken through the nostrils reveals the slight scent of freshly cut grass. A blink of the eye, a flutter of the lash, and bright lights surround me from above, pattern one inch grass underfoot, soft leather on my palm. Out of the heavens hurdles a 5.5 ounce, 216 scarlet letter stitch sphere of immense and unimaginable velocity. I reach my right hand up, armored with only a thin layer of worn brown leather, to the sky to end this terrible meteor's flight, stopping what otherwise would destroy my fragile body of 206 bones, muscle fibers, and blood cells, preventing this tiny 5.5 ounce, 2.5 inch diameter death ball from smashing me to smithereens. As the ball slams into my mid, I stagger, dropping to one knee, forcing this unstoppable force to halt for this immovable moving object. Thunderous cheering mixed with groans of terror ripple through the crowd, around me, through me, in me. I stand, look to my hand to see that terrible damage done, find none, and look up to gaze upon the emptiness of the moon, crater pocked and dustily driven, forever spinning its way around Earth, our body, our holy sweet planet of love and warp in which our beautiful moon looks at us with indifference. For what does our world mean to our moon? Our moon must be pretty annoyed that someone who took a small step for man and a great leap for mankind stabbed a flag into its skin, claiming it for a nation of freedom. Before our moon was free, it now bears the brand of ownership by a country that's chief claim is that it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. Space dust floats by me and I sneeze. Sniffling, I look up from the paper in front of me, the people staring at me for causing a commotion. A test of great importance sits before me, the bar exam to make my future, a BAR rifle in hand to protect that future, a bar in which I threw that future away in pools of alcohol, a bar of gold to make me a, a fortune, a bar of soap to wash away the grime of hard day's work, a, a gate to bar my way from my goals, a bar of chocolate to give to little children full of innocent smiles, a car that I'm losing command of, sliding on ice, slipping into an intersection, slamming into an SUV, going the opposite way on a mission, poof, goes my dream bubble. I leap up in bed, sweating, in my own blue room, with newspaper clippings on all the walls, a book about the Red Baron and a glass of water on my windowsill. I check the clock and it reads 5.30 a.m., only an hour and a minute before my day begins, enough time to roll over and sleep for a little while longer before the chaos of everyday life begins to set in, before I set an or the unorderly, solve the problems that need solving, break down the barriers set in front of me and right the wrongs and sing my song. My head hits a soft pillow, my arms pull the warm covers back over my shoulders. My eyes slowly shut, filled with Mr. Sandman, enter Sandman, heavy, filled, sleep, sand, and poof, I start falling again. So we were running a little low on time, so we can't do jokes, but next up we have Miss Gemma Fisher. So um, this poem is untitled. On dark winter mornings, I want to slough off my skin like a new snake 
and fling myself jagged into the blue. I want to teach myself how to speak the language of snails, look up at the biting dark of the sky, sharpen my teeth on stones. Slowly, words will shrivel, unravel, fade into sticks, soil, feathers, the beady eye of a rodent, pine needle soft on a forest floor, rustles from the tips of, tree, of trees. Syllables sunken like the smallest rib bones of a long dead undulate curl up in the cold. As I sneak farther away, I leave letters like breadcrumbs behind me. Thank you. Next up, Casey Edmonds Estes. The man walked, stumbled down the passageways, dashed through the corridors, doubled back and back again until he despaired of ever leaving his godforsaken labyrinth. The man walked. Nobody had warned him that the shields and walls he put up to keep all else out would also keep him in, or that walls, once up, were so hard to take back down. The man walked, passing places and things he had seen and done, but would do no more. Passing through shadows of shadows of shades of the chances he had missed and would now never take. The man walked, in the darkness, down the passages, round the corners, through the mazes of his broken mind. Next up, we have Jaylene Rivera. called the girl that wasn't ready. She doesn't understand why your actions never match anything you say or promise. It's scary to know that she's violated and disrespected in her own body, her temple. You poisoned her, but somehow she still wants, she's still the one to blame. Of course, you both did wrong. You should have been more careful, but she didn't ask for this abuse. You didn't deny her in that moment. As a matter of fact, in that moment, she thought you loved her but maybe she was just getting ahead of herself again. And even though she tries to comfort you and make you feel better, you push her away. What did she do wrong? Is she wrong? She can't do this on her own. Help her. Don't leave without a second word. Don't make her do this on her own. If you do, her heart will mean nothing, like a crumpled piece of paper. Nothing. Like that. <laughs> Thank you, every Thank you, everybody, for listening. We have one last poet. It'll be Unza Butt, and I want to... Shout out to Aiden Hirsch, and I want everyone to listen to uh, every word Unza says before getting up. See you. Have a nice day. Um, I'll call this. Can I have a moment of silence, please? I'm going to be straight up with y'all. For real, I'm not no ordinary guy. My name, no one's heard of. My last name, they ask me why. Cause in the land of the free, my name, I guess it's just ass. But we're the ones who reign our land the grass. I'm foreign, but my thoughts be soaring about how life came to be. It's amazing and beautiful, just so far from boring. But as nice as it seems, it's also a little dark. A time I remember once bawling in the park when a dude came to me and he made a little comment. Man, you're nothing but one of those with the garments. Well, at first to me, it didn't make any sense until I said, I'm sorry, and he got a little tense. He looking at me furious, but my mind is very calm. Yeah, you ain't nothing. Go back to making bombs. The world doesn't need your kind. We need peace. So go back and stay in the dirty Middle East. I don't understand. My whole life I've been the man. I gave him people hope. I gave them a helping hand. I was raised to respect to love and to enjoy, so why am I affiliated with the ones who destroy? 
the extreme exhuming terror, the evil beings who love to kill, they don't represent my race or my will. But to me, in the world, in the world, it doesn't matter what religion. There's the good, there's the bad, the two real divisions. Hurting people is a sin, and killing is forbidden. In the Quran, wherever I read, everywhere it is written to support all faces, no matter what their age is, disregard their races, to see how far the love chases. A good man is kind in the mind and in the heart. The, man, the mind of the bad is cold and very dark. The world needs to stop with the racism and the hate to bring peace and put the earth in a better state for all those who were shattered and emotionally hurt because of their race or religion who've been receiving some dirt. You can't be judged for your color, so no need to fear. What makes you a better person is if your heart is clear and inside that you know what is good and what is bad, bringing in happiness to the ones who are sad. I hope all this one day will fortunately cease for all people who have been hurt. Can I have a moment of silence, please? Let's have one final round of applause for all of our poets. Let's do and thank you, everyone.